Okay, so um, why sweat it? What's so hot about menopause? We're gonna get into some of these controversies. And what I wanna do is I wanna start out by just uh, clarifying that when we talk about women, we generally do talk about different reproductive phases. And so, um, I don't know if my pointer, I guess it's not working. So what you see is that uh, we uh, girls go through puberty about age 11, 12, actually nine to 15 is the range that we would consider. And then we talk about kind of the real active reproductive years that um, the peak is 25, age 25 is kind of the peak. Uh, and when we start to get into the perimenopause and menopause, which we'll talk about tonight, we're talking 40 to 54 for the perimenopause and 55 to 64 for what we'll call the early postmenopause, and then we move on into uh, later years. So I'm not sure if you can see this, and my pointer unfortunately isn't working, but the point I wanna make here is that when we are conceived, um, very quickly we make about seven million primary follicles, which are going to be the eggs. And by the time we're born, we only have two million. So before we even get born, we've lost five million of these eggs. And then it's just kind of keep losing them. So by the time we get to puberty, we have 500,000. Um, and then they just keep decreasing until you get to menopause when essentially there aren't any more. And so th these um, eggs are really the source of estrogen. It's hard to see this in this particular slide, but that's where we're gonna get our estrogen producing um, cells and our progestin cells. So this is something that happens with ovulation and, and each menstrual cycle you're producing this estrogen. Now there's actually, oops, um, there's actually uh, a lot of changes that happen that we're not as aware of, so that when you look between puberty and the first year after puberty, cycles are very random. Um, there's big periods where you have anovulatory cycles, so that you see these cycles are really kind of just getting going, and then you get into kind of the real reproductive years, so maybe age 15. Uh, these things vary in de depending on race, ethnicity, and a number of other factors. Body weight is a big issue. But what you see is that then you have these real regular years of normal menstrual cycles that peaks about 25, as I said, and then it's actually changing from that point on until you finally get to the point where the last of the eggs is ovulating, and it's a little bit of a kind of a sputtering end there so that you might go 11 months without a menstrual cycle and then suddenly have another one. Uh, we actually use 12 months since the last menstrual period as the definition of menopause. And this slide's a little confusing maybe, but just to make the point that when we look at the number of these primary follicles, they're very high. This is actually a slide that's giving you the height of the bar is the average um, non-growing follicle, and then um, the width is how many you actually have in the sample. And what you see is that by the time we're about 35, we don't have very many eggs left. And this is one reason why IVF becomes important, where you start to, if you're trying to have a baby and you're getting into those later 30s, it's really challenging to do that for some women because there just aren't enough eggs to ovulate. And so a lot of work would have to be done at those years. And really in this 40 to 54, or 40 to 50 range, women often don't know if they're pregnant, if they're going through menopause, or if they have some other problem. So it's a confusing time because you, your cycles just look different. And the slide on the other side is just showing you that curve that we hit this menopausal threshold and in, in the whole population you just see that these eggs are just slowly disappearing until we get to menopause. And we used to talk about menopause, so 20 years ago when Nora was talking about that, we kind of talked about menopause like you just went over a cliff. You were like premenopausal one day and the next day you were postmenopausal. And, and the literature is full of stuff like that too, which is really annoying when you're trying to understand the life course because there's um, these rules in, in research that we want to have women who have normal menstrual cycles or no menstrual cycles. And there's about a 20 year period where you have some variation on that theme. And so we actually don't have very good research on women in those mid-year 
those midlife years because we're trying so hard to get them on this side or that side of this menopausal cliff. And it's not a cliff. What you see is that, um, and this actually 2001 was when they had the big consensus conference on this to look at the fact that we need to be talking about the whole thing as a change period. So in our reproductive years, we have the early reproductive that I showed you, the peak years, then the late years. And then we go into a menopausal transition, which can last um, for most women, it's about three years, but it can last five years, it can last 10 years, and there are some women who have, continue having hot flushes the rest of their lives. Um, there's actually data from Sweden that shows that about 9% of this population continue having hot flushes into their 70s. So we're very interested in the physiology of those women because they are quite unique, uh, and they no longer really have eggs, so it's not an estrogen thing, it's something else, and we don't have good enough data on that. But the point I want to make on this slide is that it's a long, slow change. We're changing kind of from the very beginning to the time that we get into menopause. Um, so when we talk about the menopausal transition, uh, basically this is estrogen is decreasing and that's going to play a big role, but it turns out you can't just measure a person's estrogen to get a clue about what's going on with hot flushes or a number of the changes. So it isn't just estrogen. There are changes in the brain and we need to understand those and we don't fully understand them. But what happens with those changes, so first of all you get ir irregular menstrual cycles. Um, and the problem that probably most of you are here about is vasomotor symptoms, so the hot flushes, which is a really interesting phenomenon when you take it on an infrared camera, you can actually see the heat rising up, you can actually see this change occurring, and then what happens is women often will um, just have a real shift in that blood flow and they'll actually be chilled. And so um, in the very beginning, chilling is actually almost as common as hot flushes for some women. Uh, I know that was true for me. I, was, I would be under heat lamps and people would say, I thought you said you were menopausal. It's like, yeah, and I know I'm gonna have a hot flush in a minute, but I'm just freezing right now and then the next minute. So it's a really interesting phenomenon that we don't fully understand and I'll come back to that. Um, and these happen at night, and I'll talk more about that in a moment too. The other problem is the urogenital um, and vaginal symptoms. Without estrogen, you don't lubricate as well, and so a lot of women will get vaginal itching, dryness, painful intercourse, which is a real problem, uh, topical estrogen, topical creams, it, or topical, it actually turns out the KY jelly is probably the best thing you could use, um, is a way to kind of overcome some of that. But that's a problem, and then there is a transitory bone loss. So you lose a lot of bone in a two to three year phase, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like, and then you continue, resu you resume a slow steady bone loss that you'll see. Now when we talk about natural menopause, this is average age is 51, 52 in California. It varies a little bit in different states, largely related to the obesity issues of the different states. But um, we use the definition of no menstrual bleeding for 12 months to say that you have now made it through natural menopause. There's also surgical menopause that occurs by taking both ovaries out, not the uterus, the ovaries, and that can happen at any age. So it could happen young, it could happen, well, usually you're going to go through normal menopause um, and so it doesn't matter about removing ovaries after your natural menopause. Um, okay, so when we talk about this, immense, this irregular bleeding, um, all patterns are common. So you can have heavier bleeding, lighter bleeding. Some women have such heavy bleeding that they become anemic which is another problem. Um, you can have lighter bleeding, you can have longer cycles, shorter cycles. All of this is basically common. Uh, and different women will differ in terms of that. Uh, as I mentioned about 90% uh, of women have about four to eight, actually I didn't mention that, but about 90% of women have about four to eight years of cycle changes. So they're becoming noticeably different, but they still are having their menstrual cycles. So they'll think that I'm still menstruating like I always did, but in fact, if you were keeping logs, you, you aren't anymore. You're definitely showing changes. And I've already said all of that. Okay, so when we talk about this transition, um, to understand something about estrogen, you can make estrogen after menopause, um, and you make it in the adrenal glands, and basically these adrenal hormones can be converted to estrogen. Estrone is the most common estrogen in the postmenopausal woman. 
um, and you actually can convert testosterone and androgens also to, an to estrogens. So there is some estrogen, and the place where we really see this is in obese women. It turns out that you convert androgens made from the adrenal gland to estrogens, and so estrogen levels are actually higher in obese women than they are in uh, thin women. And um, people used to think, well, therefore, they'll have less hot flushes. But a, an important study was done, and is still being done, called the Study of Women Across the Nation, or the SWAN study, and that's the link for it, um, that basically showed, and they followed women. They had women who were aged 42 to 52, about 3,000 of them, and they followed them with the expectation that they would all become menopausal in the course of the study, and they had to get renewed three times before that actually happened. So this was where we started to learn that, you know, we go on out past age 56. That's not the case that women are done by 56. Some women aren't, and some women start earlier. But what they learned in this study was that obese women actually have more hot flushes and that one of the things that we really are trying to encourage women to realize is that losing weight will help you resolve, resolve these hot flushes if you're having that problem. And essentially the deal is that you are, you're insulated, that that body fat is insulating you and so you can't dissipate the heat as quickly. So thin women actually um, have those hot flushes but they're, they're and they also have those chills a lot more because of this situation. So we're really interested in the body composition part of this. There was a State of the Science conference back in 2005. You can actually download that entire conference. It's a little old now, so I'm not sure that's where you want to go. But another great source is the North American Menopause Society, uh, which has a, a lot of information about the, the new issues with, hot, with menopause. So coming back to the hot flushes, also called hot flashes, so if you're trying to figure out what's the difference between a hot flush and a hot flash, um, none of us really know what it's supposed to be. So we go back and forth with hot flushes and hot flashes. Um, and we don't really know what it is. So there have been some really interesting studies trying to figure out in the hypothalamus there's a temperature control sy uh, system that normally keeps our body temperature within fairly narrow windows. Women are already different from men by virtue of the fact that over the course of every menstrual cycle you change your body temperature by about half a degree. So as soon as you ovulate, the progesterone that comes on board with the corpus luteum increases your body temperature about half a degree, which women actually use to figure out when they ovulated. So women will do their temperature taking. So we're used to having our temperature fluctuate a bit, but we have a rather narrow range in which we're going to make adjustments. And those adjustments will be opening up the blood vessels so that we can basically bring blood to the surface to dissipate the heat and closing down the blood vessels so that we will retain all of that heat. And what seems to happen in menopause is that gauge becomes so narrow that we don't respond quickly enough, and by the time we respond, it's too late, and we're already overheated. So this seems to be one of the def one of the explanations. But again, we really don't have good neuroscience information on this, and we really would like to get that information. Now, in terms of triggers, um, and I already mentioned that estrogen levels alone do not predict who's going to have hot flushes and who isn't. But with triggers, there are certain things that will really trigger a hot flush. Um, so for me, single malt scotch was off the table for three years. I put away all my turtleneck sweaters. I stopped eating hot soups. Things that would make you hot if you were out in the cold. So any of you have ever hiked in the cold, anything that you would have taken to get warm is going to be a big trigger for a hot flush. And so we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a way to identify your triggers and then avoid those triggers so that you don't actually trigger that hot flush. Now I will tell you that a lot of women um, will tell you how many hot flushes they have. When you actually measure it in the lab, you have a lot more than you realize you have. So we're only aware of the ones that are kind of the most problematic, but there are subtle hot flushes along the way. So the triggers are warm temperatures. Um, women who are really s suffering with hot flushes tend to have fans all over the place. Um, higher body mass, we've already talked about. Cigarette smoking increases hot flushes. Um, less physical activity, it's even when you adjust for the obesity factor. Certain foods, I mentioned alcohol. For some women, caffeine. For some women, spicy foods. 
hot drinks and soups I've already mentioned. And then there are certain drugs, and these drugs, tamoxifen and raloxifen, are drugs that we used to give to women. They still give it to women, but they have some other more updated ones that they use now. But women who had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer were immediately put on tamoxifen and raloxifen, which turns out to increase hot flushes. And so that was actually something that wasn't very attractive about those drugs. Um, in terms of symptoms, they do differ by race, ethnicity. So there, you have more hot flushes in, in African American and Hispanics, probably because of the obesity difference. Um, lower hot flushes in uh, Chinese Americans, that's really all the data we have. We don't have every Asian group that uh, we could in the U.S. Um, it's, they are much worse the younger you are, the older you are, the, the, the more that these decline. Uh, I've already talked about obesity. Secondhand smoke will also be a factor, not just smoking. Um, if you have a history of premenstrual symptoms, that group of women tend to have more hot flushes. Um, certain over-the-counter pain medications, what isn't clear is if the pain medication is causal or if it's because you're taking pain medication that there's something else going on in that pathway. So it's only an association. Uh, certain comorbidities, so women with heart disease and high blood pressure, again, these are also related to obesity and perceived stress. So these are some of the things that came out of the SWAN study. Um, so in terms of sleep disturbances, something to realize is they're very common anyway, independent of menopause, but um, women with nighttime hot flushes are particularly struggling with sleep problems. Uh, most adults need six to nine hours, but you don't want to be waking up every so often. Now I'll tell you, they've done some really interesting, interesting studies trying to figure out, does the hot flush wake you up, or do you wake up and have the hot flush? And it turns out that in those studies, it's about 50-50 in terms of the time course, and most likely there's something else that's activating both your waking and the hot flush, and so that's why you can't figure out they're not cause and effect as much as whatever it is that woke you up is also in the pathway for causing this hot flush. And we still don't understand it very well. Um, so I think we've talked about ovarian hormones advancing age, uh, stress is certainly one. There's a lot of work being done on mindful meditation as a way to calm down and yoga. Um, they're not powerful interventions, but they do work. And a lot of things work better in closer to menopause before you really kind of have your 12 months of the last menstrual cycle. So something I'll just tell you that's very frustrating in the research world for me is that the FDA laid out rules saying that you need to be 12 months past your last menstrual cycle, but a lot of women have their worst hot flushes before that 12 months is hit, and so we don't have good research on it. We've, we've kind of lock, blocked out the women who have this early perimenopausal phase in a lot of the research studies, and that might be the place where soy and these other things, clover and these other things that we talk about could be beneficial to women they're not beneficial 12 months past the last menstrual cycle, so we'll get to that. Um, I do just want to say that for sleep, um, you could take estrogen, that might help, but there's also cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia and sleep. And so sleep hygiene is something that we really try and encourage women, whether you have hot flush problems, sleep, uh, uh, night sweats or not, but basically sleep hygiene is that you're going to get your, your light and your noise down, um, you have cooler temperatures in the bedroom, you avoid, a hev you avoid heavy meals. Heavy meals cause this thermic effect of food, uh, the very thing that would warm you up if you were out in cold weather, that's a great hot flush trigger, so don't do that. Have lighter meals, uh, we've already talked about certain things you're going to avoid. Um, Exercise, but not right before bedtime. That's also going to raise your body temperature and trigger the hot flush. Um, in sleep hygiene, we say use the bedroom for sleep and for sex, and that's it. You're not going to sit there watching TV and munching on your food and all the things that you do. Um, have a regular sleep schedule, even on weekends, and use these re relaxation techniques. So this is a strategy that takes a lot of discipline but basically you do have some control of your body and we're trying to get women to realize that they, they can do this. Um, so in terms of lifestyle approaches to the problem, um, it's 
limited effectiveness is cooling the body temperature. Um, so slushy drinks and things like that don't seem to be very powerful, but it has a little bit of effect. Uh, exercise actually hasn't turned out to be particularly powerful. Um, the relaxing activities, I think they have reasonable effectiveness, especially early on uh, in the menopause phase. So yoga, massage, meditation, pace res respiration, leisurely baths, but not too hot. Um, and then avoid these triggers. And I added turtlenecks because that was a real trigger for me. And again, anything that changes your body temperature, you have to learn how to control your body temperature is the bottom line. So a lot of women want to talk about phytoestrogens and soy products. Uh, it turns out that in placebo-controlled trials, they don't work. But those trials are done with this 12 months past the last menstrual cycle. So they may actually work in the early phases of menopause, and I don't think we've done the right research to test that. So there's a kind of a group going now saying, we've got to look at this before this last menstrual cycle. That's OK for, for drugs, which is what the FDA is about, but it doesn't really make sense for these things. So in fact, what hasn't really turned out to be very powerful is red clover, black cohosh, vitamin E, um, donkwe, ginseng, pre evening primrose. These are all things that you hear about. In the 12 months past the last menstrual cycle, they're not very effective. But they might work. We don't have very much evidence to suggest they're not safe or healthy. So it's something that it's worth a try. Um, however, as I said, that it's not going to, it's probably going to stop working after a while as you get farther into your menopause. Um, other ones is we're going to talk about menopausal hormones. Uh, what you should realize is that's really the only FDA-approved treatment for menopausal symptoms. All those other ones are, um, some of them are for depression, and so it turns out that clonidine, for instance, uh, let's see if I have it up there, um, is something that uh, is really for depression, but it seems to have some benefit to menopause. We wouldn't recommend that you take it just for that purpose, but it's a twofer. If you have one problem, then you would be able to resolve potentially both problems. That said, I can tell you that more recent data on all of these venlafaxine and paroxetine, these have been uh, recently studied in the last two years, and they don't look like they work using that 12 months rule. So we're kind of running out of drug therapies that are better than estrogen, and so people want to get into estrogen. Now, the reason that I got into this is I was actually studying whether hormone therapy should be used to prevent diseases of aging, because if you look at this graph, what you see is that the age of menopause really hasn't changed over time, but the age of our life expectancy has. So it was kind of a non-problem for women back in the 1800s, but about 1900, our life expectancy curve went past 50 and just kept rising. And actually, this graph is a little weird because it shouldn't really keep rising because it is continuing to rise. And so what has interested me is whether we should be talking about these things for preventing diseases of aging, which is really where we were. So the 20 years ago that Nora talked about was a phase where physicians were encouraging women to go on these hormones to prevent heart disease, to prevent dementia, to prevent bone loss, basically to prevent aging. And what you look, what you see on these particular graphs is first of all, in the upper, let's see, for you it's the upper left, um, you see men versus women in terms of bone mineral density. And what you can see is that both men and women uh, peak about 25 to 30. And then they both have a slow, steady decline in their bone loss. What's different between men and women are two things. One, women never peak as much as men do. So they don't get as much. And this is a gross generalization. There's certainly some women with denser bones than some men. But um, by and large, when we look at this, we see that men hit a higher peak. And so they have a lot farther to fall before they're going to hit the fracture threshold. But then because of menopause, women have this accelerated loss for about two to three years and then they resume that slow, steady loss. So they actually reach the fracture threshold about 10 years before men. And just to understand something about men, osteoporosis is something that we often call a woman's disease. One out of three hip fractures is a man. And so I actually have a huge study of, study, uh, study of osteoporotic fractures in men, because we've been studying women, and we don't know very much about these things in men. 
actually we know a lot about it now because we've been studying them for 11 years, and what we actually know in men is that what predicts falls and fractures is not so much bone density as it is muscle quality and frailty. And probably that's really important in women as well, that it's muscle loss that plays a big role in our falling. And then if you have light bones, you're going to have a, a light, greater chance of breaking them. The other one I wanted to point out on this slide is in the bottom right corner. And this relates to the fact that people still say that women are protected against heart disease until they go through menopause and then in, that protection is lost. But in fact, there's no evidence to support that statement. And I can't tell you how many articles start out that way. They're, they're, they're better now, but before, mm -hmm. nine, before 2002 when WHI came out, almost every article starts that way. And what you see on this curve is it's a logarithmic graph, but heart disease is the top one. And you see that it's a very steady age-related increase. There's no evidence that menopause changes the, 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 the slope of that curve at all. And just to get a contrast for that breast cancer, in the epidemiology, we do see a big change at menopause. And that change is that women have a very steep curve for breast cancer as we age because of our own endogenous estrogen levels. So your estrogen levels increase your risk of breast cancer. When you go through menopause, you continue having an increase in breast cancer risk associated with age, but you can see the shape of that curve has really shifted dramatically once we get the estrogen out out of our bodies. So menopause actually decreases your risk of having breast cancer. Um, and this is just showing you the same thing looking at men versus women, that when you look at these curves, men, the difference between men and women is that men just start having heart attacks about 10 years earlier than, men, than women do. Otherwise, the shape of the curves are quite similar. And the place where men and women start to differ is at puberty, probably related to um, testosterone in boys causing HDL to go down and other factors uh, more than it is about estrogen. But this estrogen myth got into the literature. It sold a lot of drugs. I can tell you that this was the number one prescribed drug before the Women's Health Initiative came out. And so that continues in the literature, but there's really no evidence that menopause changes that curve dramatically. That said, there's actually some good rationale for it because we do see slight changes in body composition with menopause, and it relates to where we distribute our fat. So one of the differences between men and women is that we tend to put our fat in our thighs and our hips and our subcutaneous under our skin, and that turns out to be a safe place to have fat stored. The place where you don't want fat is in the intra-abdominal cavity. So around the organs inside the abdominal cavity. And after menopause, we start to have a slow shift. Without estrogen, we start to redeposit, redistribute that fat. And so it's not going to be something that's so quick that we're going to see it on these curves. But it probably is a subtle effect. So to talk about menopausal hormones, first of all, they've been with us a long time. Um, the FDA approved conjugated equine estrogen, which is essentially Premarin for the treatment of menopausal symptoms. Uh, it was called hormone replacement therapy. I never used the word HRT or replacement. I don't think we need to replace it, but it's still very much part of our vocabulary. Uh, it did come out in 1942. Um, it was FDA approved in 1942. And what you can see on this curve is the prescription starting from 1960 in this case, just really going very, very steep, incredibly good marketing on the part of the company that was selling it. Um, and what you see, that big drop, and kind of along the way is the literature that's coming out over time. And I'm not going to take you through all of these pieces, but just to say a few things. Um, well, maybe I'll take you through all the pieces quickly and say that oral contraceptives, when they first came out, they came out at really high doses. And we saw that the women who were taking those high doses, young women, were getting heart attacks, strokes, serious blood clots. And that was really seen as being a, a, a problem. And immediately the doses were dropped. And so now we have re reasonably safe doses. There's still some women that are highly susceptible even to those doses. And they'll get a blood clot when they're in their 20s. Um, a book came out called Feminine Forever that basically put a lot of the mythology into our culture, the idea that estrogen protects your skin, keeps your breasts from sagging. If you read this as a feminist, it's really a hard read. 
because it's all about being beautiful and young and estrogen is going to prevent all of that from happening so that you'll be the wonderful wife that you were meant to be and, and mother. But at any rate, it was turns out that Robert Wilson, who wrote the book, was funded completely by Wyeth that was selling the drugs. Um, and a lot of those myths are still in there and some of them may be true, but we don't have the evidence to say yes or no. Um, another study that was done of interest was the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute funded a huge study of men with the argument that women get less heart disease and it must be because of estrogen. So we jumped to these scientific conclusions. And so they did this huge study of men taking conjugated equine estrogens and those men immediately got blood clots and heart attacks and serious cardiovascular problems. And so those arms were cut. And yet we still marched along saying that this is a good thing for postmenopausal women. Now that big drop that you see in the prescriptions of estrogen came in 1975 when the New England Journal of Medicine published two papers that, that um, showed that women who were using estrogen who had a uterus were getting cancer of the uterus at a much higher rate, four to seven fold higher rates. And cancer scares all of us and so women came off those pills very quickly and at that point, endocrinologists jumped on board and said, well, you know, in the normal woman, you have progesterone counterbalancing that estrogen in the uterus. And if we gave a woman progestins, if she has a uterus, we could counteract that estrogen. And so from that point on, we had two ways of treating women. If you had a hysterectomy, you would get estrogen only. And if you had your uterus, you would get estrogen and progestin to prevent the cancer of the uterus. And that's pretty much still the way we divide women today, that a uterus um, means that you're going to get estrogen and progestin. Even if you're taking a patch, if you're taking a low dose, you often will get a progestin. So in the meantime, enough women were on these hormones that we were developing an observational database that started to show other interesting factors. Women who were on the estrogen were getting fewer bone fractures. Uh, the data started to emerge that those women were getting less heart disease. The data immediately followed that they were getting more breast cancers. And so this 20-year thing that Nora talked about, the controversies, was the fact that we had benefits and risks, and it was a really challenging decision. Do we take the benefits and risks? And I'm not going to take you through all of the marketing that was done to get women to the point of these prescriptions continuing to rise. But there was no su clinical trial until 1995. The PEPI study, which was done here at Stanford, so we were one of the researchers, and there were seven clinical centers. It stands for Postmenopausal Estrogen Progestin Intervention Trial. It was just looking at risk factors for heart disease. And it came up with a mixed picture that was interpreted by people selling the drugs as all benefit and the people who were wondering about the risk benefit as we need to do more research on this before we have all the women in this country going on this hormone. And so the HER study was actually the next one that got funded. This was the heart and estrogen replacement study of women with a heart attack already or with established heart disease to try and find out whether uh, going on the hormones would prevent heart disease. And just in a nutshell, I can tell you that in 1997, before this paper was published, the American College of Cardiologists actually had in their recommendations for the cardiologist treating a woman who's had a heart attack is if she's had a heart attack, consider hormone therapy. You should put her on hormones. And then in 1998, we published the HERS data that basically showed that women who were put, in, put on the estrogen and progestin had more heart attacks, not fewer heart attacks, in the first year. And that over four years, there was no difference. And so it wasn't something that we should have been doing. But it was part of medical practice. So we were at a point when WHI, the Women's Health Initiative, started in 1991. So this was before HERS came out, it was before PEPI came out. We still had this big question. We had a puzzle, like should we put women on these hormones? And so I've already answered part of the puzzle by saying, okay, HERS said no, not for secondary prevention. If a woman's had a heart attack, don't put her on estrogen and progestin. But if she didn't, then maybe there still is benefit and we should test this hypothesis. And also with stroke, we didn't know the whole story. I'll show you a, a balance beam in a moment that will be, or not a balance beam, but a, a balance that will talk about this. But we had little bits of pieces throughout the literature suggesting that there may be benefit here, there may be harm there, but it was a puzzle. We didn't really know. 
And so in the case of the Women's Health Initiative, this was a huge study. It also had a big diet trial and a big calcium and vitamin D trial and an observational study. So it had a lot more, and you're reading papers that come from the other parts of the study. But the hormone study is what I'm going to focus on. There's a great website to get all the information if you want to get that. Um, but in a nutshell, the way that it was set up is women who um, we recruited 27,000 plus women into this trial at 40 clinical centers across the United States. So this was a huge study. And if a woman had a hysterectomy, she would be assigned to estrogen only in the form of conjugated equine estrogen. And just to kind of, those of you who know Latin, equine is horses. This is something that essentially is extracted from the urine of pregnant horses, and the horse is actually put in a, in a stable condition for nine months with a catheter, collecting this urine and then extracting the estrogen from the horse. And that's what Premarin, pregnant mare urine, is. So this is the most widely prescribed estrogen still in this country. So they were assigned to either that or a placebo, and you see it was nearly 11,000 women. If they still had their uterus, they would be put in the estrogen and progestin trial, which I'll call the E plus P trial, and they got the same estrogen plus the most commonly prescribed progestin of the day and still, medroxyprogesterone acetate or placebo. So it's a randomized trial, and there's a little more information on this slide than you need, so I'll just basically make the point that it's two trials then. It's a trial of women with a uterus on estrogen and progestin or placebo, and it's a trial of women with a hysterectomy on estrogen or placebo. And our primary outcome was heart disease, but we were very uh, focused on other cardiovascular endpoints, so stroke, these blood clots, particularly in the lungs, which are quite dangerous. Uh, we looked at the blood clots in the legs as well. Cancer, breast cancer, uterine cancer, colorectal cancer, um, frac hip fractures, other deaths, and then we did a special study of older women, the women who were 65. So this whole study was done in women 50 to 79, but we did another study of women in that group who were 65 plus to look at dementia and whether we really could see differences in dementia. And we had a rule where you basically would try and look at the overall picture of all of these things. And I can just tell you, it's almost never done. Most medical research looks at one drug and one outcome at a time. It very rarely looks at multiple outcomes, even though you put that pill in your mouth and it goes everywhere. And it does something to more than one system that's being studied. So the beauty of this study was that we really were looking at the whole picture. And this is, gives you a kind of a, a, a quick look. The, the way that the balance was set up is based on the epidemiological literature, if um, there was the expectation of huge benefit. This was where we were in the early 90s, believing that women would pre we could prevent heart disease by putting women on estrogen or estrogen and progestin. We were concerned about breast cancer, so that was also built into it. Stroke was bouncing all over the place in the epidemiological literature, so we didn't really know where to put it in the, the monitoring plan. Um, we did expect blood clots. Um, and we did expect benefit to bone, and we had stopping rules that basically it would be unethical to continue the study if all of our hypotheses were so wrong that a woman on placebo was really getting more heart attacks and in danger, and it would be equally bad to keep a woman on the hormones if she was getting more breast cancer. So that was the way it was set up, and just to kind of jump right through uh, years of study, um, in the estrogen and progestin trial, the big story, then it was really still one of the biggest medical stories of all time, the July 2002 story, um, was that we stopped the estrogen and progestin trial, so the trial of women with a uterus, because first of all, an a priori flag for breast cancer was hit that would not have stopped this trial. The rules of the trial, the stopping rules, were that the overall picture had to be one of harm for any one harm thing to matter. And by that time, we already had enough benefit to bone and colorectal cancer that that would have kept it flat. The problem was the major hypothesis was wrong. Women got more heart attacks, more strokes, more blood clots, as well as more breast cancer. So we had 20 million women in this country on this drug to prevent heart disease 
and we learned that in fact it increased cardiovascular disease. Now that was estrogen and progestin. Um, this is a complicated slide. The main point I want to make with this is that we looked at the actual number of events and many physicians will tell you, oh, it's nothing. It's only seven per 10,000 per year more heart attacks and it's only eight per 10,000 per year more strokes and so on and so forth. Clearly by the time you add them up, you've got 35 bad things and 11 good things, but I'll tell you that if it had been seven per 10,000 per year fewer heart attacks, every woman in this room would be on this hormone because we did see 30% as huge from a population perspective. So for people to say, oh, it's not, doesn't matter, is really deceptive. But to kind of move on, the other part of it was the dementia study. And in the dementia study, we essentially had the largest study ever done on hormones in dementia. We had over 4,500 women in the estrogen and progestin trial. We had nearly 3,000 in the estrogen only trial. This was set up with very good cognitive function testing. We actually had to get MRIs to prove that there was dementia. We had got blood work. And the bottom line was, and I can tell you that when we stopped the estrogen and progestin trial, for the heart disease and all those other things. I had participants call me and say, I can't stop these hormones. My daughter's so worried that I'm gonna get Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and she said that it, this would prevent it. And I said, well, I think you should stop those pills because pretty soon you'll see the rest of that story. And the rest of that story was, what you see in the step thing with the, the um, in, this is basically accumulation of dementia diagnosis. It's step because we only did the testing once a year. So once a year, we'd bring women in and we'd find out, oh, there are more women with dementia in the estrogen and progestin trial than the placebo trial, that's orange. And every year we saw that to the point where by the time we had to stop the trial, it was twofold higher cases of dementia. Granted, these were women that were at the lower end, they already had some cognitive dysfunction. So taking the estrogen and progestin kind of just tipped them over the edge. It's not like it's a dangerous thing for most people, but it was twofold higher, not a decrease like we had been telling people. So this got a huge story. This was a really big story. And right after the hormone story for menopausal hormones, people started saying, well, what about menopause? I'm suffering. So we suddenly had this problem where we were studying diseases of aging, and now we had this whole group of younger women saying, wait, I can't take, I can't take off, go, go off my hormones. I need my hormones. So this ended up being this very interesting era where we were trying to figure out, okay, is it different for older women? Is it different for younger women? And I can just tell you that a lot of women came off their hormones. So this is showing you across the country that slow, steady increase of hormone use here. And then when the, S, when the WHI was published, huge drops across the country. And a lot of people were suffering and miserable. It was a bad time for a menopausal woman uh, to suddenly, nobody wanted to give her hormones and she was suffering. So it was a hard time for lots of people. Um, but I can tell you that what we learned from this, and this is not WHI, this is what's called the, it's a SEER registry. It's all cancers in the United States are monitored and they have to be reported. And this paper basically showed that in relationship to, so it's an association, it's not a trial, but as hormones came, hormone use came down across the country, breast cancer dropped in this whole country. We actually were able to see, and you can't see this with any drug I've ever seen, there's nothing that shows anything like this, to see the whole population, estrogen receptor positive breast cancers dropped in this country. Uh, very tightly related to that drop in hormone use. And actually, if you go back and look at the data in the past, you see that the increase in breast cancer that was happening back in the 80s and 90s tracks absolutely well with the increase of hormone use in those times. So we really had put a lot of women at risk for this breast cancer uh, by having this uh, idea. And we actually showed this in our own WHI observational study to just kind of talk you through this slide. On the bottom, you're seeing the drop of hormone use. On the top, women who on their own were taking hormones and said, I don't want to be in your hormone trial. I want to stay on my hormones. Or I don't want to be in your hormone trial. I don't want to go on hormones. So women had already voted with their feet in the observational study, chose on their own to be on it or not. 
the twofold thing that you're seeing here is that women who on their own were taking estrogen and progestin compared to women who on their own weren't, they had twofold higher breast cancer, continued very steady through the whole study until they dropped their hormone use, and then we saw this drop. So we were able to actually replicate it in our own sample that coming off the hormones really did reduce breast cancer. We hadn't even published the estrogen only study, so for those of you who don't have a uterus, you would be on estrogen only. The good news is, um, at the time that it was stopped, so the bad news is it got stopped too, but by that time there was no difference in heart attacks and no difference in breast cancer, no increase in breast cancer. There was actually a, a pretty strong hint of a decrease of breast cancer in the estrogen only. But it was stopped because just like the estrogen and progestin trial, there were many more strokes. So we're very clear that estrogen increases strokes. There were also fewer hip fractures, so that's a benefit. There were more blood clots. There were fewer fractures. So this picture was more balanced than the estrogen and progestin trial, um, but uh, it also was stopped for harm. And so if you've put this picture together, the reason that we still have this big debate is that there are harms and there are benefits. And so when we look at the two trials together showed no benefit for heart disease. In fact, in the estrogen and progestin trial, harm, uh, early harm. Uh, strokes and blood clots in both trials. Uh, fractures were beneficial on estrogen. It's really still the best treatment for osteoporosis that we have. I'm gonna get into that in a moment. Um, dementia, if you're 65 and over, that's the only group we studied at that time, harmful. And then breast cancer was very different in the two results. I have a little note here just to say that um, there have been breast cancer prevention studies that have looked at tamoxifen. And if we use the criteria for who goes into those trials, we actually did have one of harm here. But in the overall population, it was a decrease. Uh, and then the global index, which is this balance of risk and benefit, was clearly harmful with estrogen and progestin and pretty neutral for estrogen only. So this is our puzzle solved. Um, I've already said most of these things. I'll add a couple. Gallbladder disease turns out to be increased whether you have estro on estrogen, whether you have progestin or not. And a really interesting one was incontinence. Many gynecologists were putting women on estrogen to treat incontinence, and it turns out it increases it. So again, we really were doing bad medicine for women, and when you're doing prevention research, you're really happy when you finally get the story right. So this is a little complicated too, estrogen only. We actually, when you look at this whole picture, um, what you see is these increase in stroke, increase in blood clots, a slight decrease in breast cancer, and decrease in hip fracture. But we actually continue to follow the women. And when we follow the women in the post-intervention phase, so after they stop taking the pills, some things reverse because you actually have taken out your highest risk women. So a woman who's likely to get a stroke had the stroke, and therefore you're gonna end up with a group that's gonna be the other way. And the overall picture, actually for estrogen only, was fairly neutral with actually this very puzzling decrease in breast cancer, completely opposite from estrogen and progestin. So we still have controversies and a lot that we're trying to work our way through. And where a lot of the tension went was age. Um, are these things different if you're young and around menopause versus if you're older? And this, in the estrogen-only trial, so I'm not taking you through everything, obviously, but in the estrogen-only trial, it turned out that women in their 50s do show more benefits and that when you put the whole picture together, you have what I showed you before, but women in the 70s are really at harm going on these hormones. And so it's not a case of if you're in your 70s and you've been on them since you're 50. We don't know that. We don't have data on you know, if you've been on it 20 years. If you've been on it 20 years and you haven't had breast cancer, you're probably at low risk for getting breast cancer on estrogen. It's gonna show up sooner. But we wouldn't wanna start a woman in her 70s on these hormones, which is what we were doing in the 90s. We were putting a lot of women in this country on these hormones. So, um, what people then wanted to do is they really wanted to look at young women. And so the whole debate went around, okay, what about women at the age of menopause? And so a study that has not yet been published, but it has been presented, and so I can show you unpublished data, 
It's called the KEEPS trial that really designed the study around the menopausal age woman. And so these women were 42 to 59. They had to be um, within three years of their final menstrual period. So they had to be pretty recently menopausal. It was went for four years. They used a lower dose oral uh, conjugated equine estrogen, but also they studied the patch. And they gave everybody a progestin, a micronized progesterone, the so-called natural progesterone, um, if they uh, had a uterus. And so this trial believed that they were going to show that for young women there's benefit. And in a nutshell, um, the, what they were going to look at, what they looked at, because I'm going to show you the results, was atherosclerosis progression using a carotid intermedial thickness measure and um, coronary artery calcification, which is another sign of, of uh, coronary disease advancement. And they had a bunch of risk factors that they looked at. They also looked at mammographic density. So it's called the uh, Kronos Early Estrogen proge Progestin uh, Study, uh, or KEEPS. And to just kind of jump to the gun, I can tell you these are kind of the characteristics of the group. First of all, one of the problems that they had is that this was a really healthy group of people because the reality is most women at the age of menopause are at pretty low risk for heart disease. Most young women, it's not likely that they're going to have this problem anyway. It's really when we get into the 70s that we're going to worry about that for women. So most physicians look at this and say, oh, I'd give anything to have the baseline data from this study. Like, what can you improve? But to just kind of jump the gun and say that in the oral co conjugated equine estrogen, this lower dose, they had the same mixed picture that we had in PEPI. It's, ident it's identical to the PEPI study, showing that there's maybe some benefit to HDL and LDL, but there's bad things for triglycerides and inflammatory factors. So it's a mixed picture. It's not one of benefit. And the patch is mostly neutral with some exceptions that relate to maybe diabetic risk. But it wasn't one of great benefit. And to get to the more important pieces, in the study where they're looking at this thing that's called the intermedial thickness of the carotid artery, um, and so I'm not going to take you through all of that, but just make the point that when they looked at the women who are on oral the oral conjugated equine estrogen, the transdermal or the patch versus placebo, they were identical. No evidence whatsoever after four years of anything that would suggest that you're going to be benefited by taking these at early ages. So this is called the timing hypothesis. It's been a big debate for a long time. We now have very clear data that it doesn't work. And the other measure that they used was this coronary artery calcification. You can actually see, with a certain kind of scan, you can see coronary artery calci calcification, which is an in increases your risk. And again, to just show you that in the three groups, absolutely identical, no evidence whatsoever of benefit. And this is true, this is looking at overall, if you actually looked um, by people who had bad scores to begin with, just no difference. So the bottom line is a lot of graphs, and if you're not used to graphs, I'm probably confusing you, but the bottom line is this hypothesis has now been tested, and it's just not true. And we just published, as I told you at the beginning, a paper um, this week in archi JAMA Archives Internal Medicine, so it's a new version of JAMA, that showed that there's absolutely no evidence that going on these hormones improves cognitive function in women in their 50 to 54 age range either. So to kind of just summarize the, where we are with hormones, there are three FDA indications for it. Uh, people have tried really hard to get indications for other things, and all the tests are failing in that. What it's really good for is hot flushes, and this is something that it is good. The problem is if you go on it, it's hard for a lot of women to come off it. Um, as I showed you with the estrogen, we're slowly dropping down over the course of our own lives. These doses were too high. So one thing we do encourage is if you're going to go on it, go on the lowest dose that you need to to solve your, your hot flushes. And don't stay on it. This is no longer stay on this the rest of my life. This is like a two to three year um, course of action. Uh, we need a lot more data on the physiology of these hot flushes so that we can really do a better job of taking care of women. The other uh, reason, the FDA reason, is for the vulvar, vulvar and vaginal atrophy. And there, as I mentioned, you really can use topical 
and KY jelly is actually quite good. You don't have to have estrogen in that, but you could use topical estrogen. That said, I can tell you that we have pr plenty of data showing that that topical estrogen does make it into the system, and some women will actually experience hot flushes again by having that when they go through the withdrawal. So going on the hormone still has this risk, and it's hard to get off it. So we're basically telling women, if you can make it through menopause without it, give that the best shot you can, because in the end, I can tell you, I've been there, done that, and it was miserable, but it's over and I don't even think about it. And that's true of just about everything that ever happened to you. If you think about every disease where you think, oh no, I'm gonna be sick the rest of my life, and then you totally forget. And so that's just you know, my take on it. The third reason is for osteoporosis, but it's for preventing bone loss. It's not once you've been diagnosed. Once you've been diagnosed, there's no FDA uh, indication to go on this to prevent the actual fracture. And that's because we just don't have the research for that. And so the recommendation is to go after one of the other, try one of the other non-estrogen medications. And it's kind of a hard one for those of us who do bone research because estrogen is much better than these other ones. Um, but the other ones, so the bisphosphonates um, and the, the CIRMS, reloxifene, which counter, which prevent breast cancer but help bones, so they're good in that way. And then there's some really powerful ones if you've got major osteoporosis. But to just kind of take you a little bit further into this, first I'll make the point that women have come off these hormones by and large in this country. We went from having it being the most highly prescribed to being fairly reasonable short term. Women are using this, so physicians have really understood the way to use this. Your physicians are guiding you. Um, you're thinking through this. That's why you're even thinking about it. When we talk about for the bones, there is the case that the way that these bisphosphonates work is they're anti-resorptive, which means in the case of bone, you have two kinds of cells. You have cells that lay down bone, and you have cells that dig out bone. And you're remodeling your bone all the time. Bone is very living, active tissue. And so anti-resorptive prevents you from digging out that bone, and that's what these bisphosphonates do. Now, a lot of women got really freaked out about bisphosphonates because of this fear of the osteonecrosis of the jaw. It was something that was actually discovered in uh, cancer patients that were um, kind of had a different problem altogether, but where we really recognize the the, the focus there is dental hygiene because the problem with the bisphosphonates is that it decreases the healing so that if bacteria gets into your bone, then you have this problem. So if you're going to use bisphosphonates, we really do encourage a lot more dental hygiene as being a way to prevent that particular problem. And so I will tell you that we also did a calcium vitamin D trial to look and see if we could prevent fractures. An interesting issue is that in the study overall, taking calcium did not work, but in the women who were 60 to 80, it did help, particularly if they were on hormones. So the interaction of hormones to, to calcium is, is good. The US Preventive Services Task Force just recently came out and did not recommend, uh, did not push for taking calcium, but I, I think the data for 60 to 80 is reasonable, and that, so that's the group that we would target for taking calcium. And I'm going to end by just saying that the Surgeon General has really looked at this issue. When we talk about bone growth, we see these phases that we go through. Um, the Surgeon General does recommend calcium. Um, it actually also recommends physically, physical activity uh, and avoiding smoking and excessive alcohol. Now, alcohol for bones there's really not such great physiology to say that it's bad for bones, but it definitely increases falls. And so that's the, pur the purpose. And the other one that we really encourage if you're worrying about falls is to really get your eyes checked so that you don't, so that your vision, there's a lot of other things that relate to falls that we're not addressing. Um, in fact, if you go into this site, they'll give you all this advice about how to fall proof your house. So get rid of rugs that are gonna slip, get rid of all the stuff that you have piled on your stairs, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things we can do that are just behavioral. We don't always have to immediately run to a drug and take a drug to prevent this. And then um, we don't recommend bone tests until you're 65 unless you have risk 
uh, big risk factors in your family. And I think that's the end of my talk. So I think I get my time. <laughs> And I'm very happy now to take questions, and I will repeat the questions. Donna. I've heard a lot about the timing hypothesis. And I wonder, are, are there any numbers or statistics of how many women in the menopausal years are, get, are getting estrogen? I mean, I, I think that's, for some doctors and women, it's sort of given them a reason to take it. So whether it's change, whether because of the timing hypothesis, yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I showed a slide and I sh shut this off so I can show. Actually, I guess I don't have my age slide, but we we actually looked at that and a lot of young women have really come off. Now we don't have the most recent up to date this year data. I think the Keep study completely obliterates the timing hypothesis. So. It's going to be, they haven't published it because it's not to anyone's benefit to <laughs> publish that. So we're getting the word out to basically say the timing hypothesis, there's no evidence to support it. It came out when hers came out, so right away people said, oh, well, the time, they, they added to the timing hypothesis that if you already have um, risk of heart disease, then going, if, you're, if you already have some cardiovascular disease, then taking estrogen and progestin would tip you over the edge. And so young women don't have that. And young women, if they got estrogen and progestin or estrogen, that would benefit them. But the, the, the KEEP study shows very clearly that it's not true. The study we just came out with isn't as good a design as the KEEPs, but also obliterates the idea of this window of opportunity that if you start it right at 50. So I don't think the timing hypothesis has resulted in huge increases, but it has. The bottom line is menopause is a really uncomfortable time and women really want relief. And so you're going to go on that hormone to take care of your relief and then after you've made it through two or three years, you're going to start to think, well, was that really true? Do I really need to take that? This is the way women were before. Physicians were encouraging them to take it. So most women will come off it naturally and they'll find out they don't have any more problems. So it's going to be hard to get everyone to, to really learn all the data. We're not going to get there. I think it's going to happen anyway. And now I think we have really good data to say the timing hypothesis isn't true. Other questions? Um, what was your conclusion on the people on just uh, estrogen only, uh, their dementia rates? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't show that. So it turned out that the estrogen only also increased dementia. And what ages? And how did it show? Oh, um, so we only, the, the, real, the really good design was just for the 65 and over. And then the, the paper that we just came out with isn't as good a design because it was after women had stopped and we were checking them there. Um, that was just like no difference. So for young women, there was no difference in changes in dementia. And for older women, estrogen increased dementia. But really women who were already on the brink. I will tell you also to add to this that people immediately said, well, it's not Alzheimer's disease, it's vascular dementia. And there's different kinds of dementia. Um, there's age-related dementia, which we actually call normal dementia, that you, we have declines with aging. That's not the same thing as Alzheimer's disease, which is a real disease. Vascular dementia, we actually tested that. We did brain MRI studies. And it turned out we didn't have evidence that it was vascular dementia. We actually, this is, this is like almost one of those things that you'd see at a, a supermarket store, a supermarket checkout. But it actually turned out that the brain was smaller. It, it shrink, the estrogen actually shrinks the estrogen parts of the brain. So the, the brain was actually decreased in volume, and that was our best explanation for this decrease in cognitive function. So long-term estrogen is not something that you would want to take to keep your, your, your mind, your, your you know, to prevent dementia. Well, I've been off, they took me off of, because of Women's Health Initiative results, took me off of estrogen. I'm almost 90, and they, I haven't had any signs of problems of any kind. I was on it for 46 years before that. Yeah, and so. I, uh, but I'm having this mental problem. I mean, my memory is just 
And suddenly, within a year, I can see the difference. And I thought, oh, <laughs> must be all those years I was on estrogen. No, I don't or think the year. Going off of it, maybe. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any study that talks about you. So she was saying she's 90 years old and her memory is starting to fail. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a lot younger than you and I have memory problems too. So I think that the bottom line is you've done incredibly well. I don't think that estrogen helped or hurt. I don't know. I mean, there's no way I can say that based on one person. But, um, you know, the reality is Alzheimer's increases very dramatically in the population with age, and this is something that it's hard to, to get around that. But estrogen, you know, was being kind of sold as the way to prevent it, and, and I think the evidence is very clear that that's not the case. But I have noticed the most definite in four years since I've been off of it is aging my skin and all that subcutaneous fat seems to be melting away in the skin and mm -hmm. I mean it's like instant old age where I would have ordinarily not been, have ever been on that medication but probably at 55 or been beginning to see some of these aging effects wrinkles and so on everything and <laughs> instead I'm getting within two or three or four years the whole thing and it's very disconcerting mm -hmm. to suddenly age over you know what I'm past what a normal like, person is. Well I think a lot of women who go through menopause so she's basically making the point that she was on hormones for 46 years and then came off and in a very three to four years started to see the signs of aging. I can tell you that if you're 90, you're doing very, very well. So, you know, whether it was the estrogen that did it for you or whether it's your, your genes, it's hard to say. But um, we don't really have good data on the skin. Uh, the only study on skin that really has shown placebo, benefits over placebo is Retin-A. Uh, so we don't have good estrogen studies to say that it does that. That said, a lot of women say that when they go through menopause, their skin changes. So that's one that even I start to think, huh, I wonder if that was true. Um, and so I've actually been talking to a dermatologist. My mind and my memory and not being able to function because I, rely, I have to rely on myself. Yeah. <laughs> but I can tell you from the observational study that, you know, there's a time frame when that happens naturally, whether you're on estrogen or not. So it's very hard to say. Uh, and you are, and the WHI didn't relate to you because we didn't have anyone who had been on hormones 46 years and took them off. You know, we don't have anyone like well, that. That's another thing. I, I used, to, you know, ever, I went on it in the very first chance I got, and I was a big enthusiast of every woman I could nail <laughs> to go on that and join up. But uh, um, we went six years that first. Funding was for six years. The stupidest thing the government, well, the worst thing they did was have no study, but after that was just funding a, a study like that of all the women in this country for six years and then quit. So you got another funding for another six years, as I recall. Is that Are I you mean? talking about the WHI? In the WHI. Oh, we're still funded. We're still well, following the women. Yeah, I would still. I've been funded so since 1993 on this study. They send you every month or so. Oh, so you're in the study? I was. Thank you. Well, no, you're still in it. You're still no, in it. Uh, their material came to me ask, asking if I would sign up for the next. Uh huh. Funding. And you said no. And I, I, I don't know what was wrong with my head at that point, but I didn't sign up again. So I have never heard. But when you came, first came out in the newspapers and everybody was screaming and yelling about everybody was going to die of estrogens and so forth, there was a, uh, uh, I almost lost my thought, what I was going to say. Uh, So, well, so, so let me just say, for all the other women in this room, uh -huh. I think we owe you a, a, an applause because to have done that study saved a lot of women really from really bad I things. Ran around with posters and, and yeah, <laughs> I think I think you deserve applause to have been a participant. No, no uh, uh, publicity about that study, and people 
good schools. Are you talking about the WHI? Yeah. Oh, no, we're, we have plenty of, I mean, did, did you guys never hear of it before? No, we, that study really, that study changed medical practice for women and it made us start to study menopause, well, which we hadn't much studied. Longer is going to continue? Um, we don't know, you know, you keep going in. I'll just tell you what You're I'm just doing now. For funding from our no, we've been getting funding all along. We've been following the women for 20 years now, I mean, since 1993. Um, I just put in from the Women's Health Initiative a physical activity trial because we want to do another trial. Mm -hmm. And I think we really should be studying physical activity. So the mean age is now 80 in the study. And people say, you can't get 80-year-old women to exercise. But I would say that the data on cognitive function, on everything that we said estrogen would do, is just as good for physical activity. And that, that's something that we should try. So we're, we just put a grant in, and I'll tell you if we get funded. You'll hear about it if we get funded. If I call the office, will they tell me if I can rejoin, if there's any point in it? Um, yeah, you can contact me, Nora. Can we, I don't know if we how, what our policy of that is, I but we'll try. I some gal in the office a few months back. OK. Well, we still exist. Yeah, I think a few more questions. A couple more questions. So are you sort of saying not to take hormones? You know, what I'm so trying to say is, it's reasonably safe for women of menopausal age to start hormones. We recommend lower doses, and we recommend that you don't stay on them. The problem is about 20% of women who go on them find it very hard to come off them. Um, so we don't really know. So people have tried cold turkey. They've tried um, tapering. Okay. You know, basically the thing about tapering is you taper, and then if you start having hot flushes, then you might want to go back on. The problem with going on it at all is that you may not be able to come off. So the answer to your question is, you know, I, I'm not going to tell. I'm not a physician. Right, right. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I chose not to go on it, and I'm on the other side, and I feel fine. I feel better than I did for those three years, but that's one person. And we're all different, and so it's very challenging. And this is true of everything in medicine, is we're all different. No study is going to be answering the question specific to who you are. But I could tell you we have enough data to say that going on it for a reasonable percent of women is really hard to come off. So. Most well, women. Have you noticed any difficulty in coming off of it exactly? Yeah. Is it too late to go back on? Well, so now the data we have for you is that you should not start hormones. <laughs> I think older women should not start hormones. So if you've yeah, been off the hormones, years, yeah, okay. yeah, I think so. And we had another question there. I just, you know, my problem is sleep. Yeah. And I, you know, I listen to Dr. Oz and whatever he's. The newest thing to recommend, you know, try this, try that, try that. You know, and you're, you're saying it sort of really doesn't. And I've also now heard that maybe our sugar drops in the middle of the night and, you know, and so then, you know, we're waking up from that. No, I'm not saying it does. estrogen does help women with sleep. Okay. Cause it definitely does. But what I'm just telling you is that we have other things that people should try. It just takes more work. I mean, the bottom line is, most of us could be a lot healthier than we are right. with no drugs, but we have to work at it. We don't get to just have it um, for free. And so the question is, if you really have sleep problems, we have really good sleep hygiene that probably you, I don't know if you've tried it or not. Yeah. OK. And so I know what she's going through. I had to save like four or five hours of sleep a night. Oh, you, okay. yeah. yeah. As soon as I went on estrogen, it was like, Again. Yeah. Yeah. Because you never, uh, you still can't. No, I'm two to three hours wake up all uh, night long. Yeah. So then you have a different issue because a lot of women when they go on and you can go on low dose and it will help, but if you're, you know, not if that's not solving your problem, then you probably have something else that you might want to focus on. Okay. It's not very high, only about 20 per So the question is, what percent of women don't have any problems with menopause? It's about less than 20 percent. 
I, you know, I, I think that estrogen really, having estrogen drop really does change your temperature regulation. I think temperature is the biggest problem. And then the vaso, the, the vulvar issues, so that you basically are dry, those are big problems. And that, so that's the main thing, as estrogen does, and it, it, it may or may not take care of the skin, I don't know, we don't have good data on that at this point, but um, the problem is it's temporary. So the good news is, after you make it through those two or three years, then your temperature's fine. You don't have that problem. Your sleep is fine. You don't have that problem. You may still have that problem because it may be something else. If estrogen's not solving the problem, yours is not directly related to estrogen. So it's a rather small percent of women that have no problems. So Marsha, if I understand what you were asking, have we studied the women, that 20% of women who don't have any symptoms? No, we really haven't studied them. No. No, it's a great question. And the other question that we haven't studied is the 9% of women who continue having hot flushes. So there's you know, two ends of the spectrum. And I can tell you what we do know from WHI is that that group of women have the worst outcomes when they go on hormones. So if we put older women who are still having hot flushes on these hormones, they are the highest risk for heart disease, for cardiovascular problems and strokes. So we saw that in the WHI. So they're another physiological group. And the bottom line is we need to understand this um, this is why I keep doing research. So, you know, WHI isn't going to answer all those questions because we're looking at a different thing. But the, because we had estrogen, we weren't studying menopause. We weren't studying anything else. It's like, oh, we have the solution to the problem. It's like, well, we, we don't because we've been giving all these women breast cancer <laughs> and all these other problems. Not estrogen only because we don't have the data to say that it causes breast cancer. But, um, you so know, stay tuned. <laughs> you know, it'll. It's going to keep happening, and, and it is the case that now I'm I'm less interested in menopause and much more interested in aging. I'm just kind of going through my own life, you know, and just feel like, well, okay, I want to figure out how to age as effectively and successfully as I can. And menopause is just a little blip. It's just like the bone thing, you know. You have this little three-year phase, and then you move on to the next wonderful frontier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's some, there's some research, so she asked if there's been medical research done on the bioidenticals. Um, not very good data because, you know, one of the things to realize about most of these drugs is that we hardly ever compare them against the gold standard. So hardly anyone does bioidentical versus actual estrogen. They'll do it against placebo. And this is true of every drug. So if you've ever heard Johnny and Anita speak, you can just see that, you know, we never compare things against the other, the, the, the competition. But the bioidenticals really haven't shown to be um, any better. Um, the problem with them is that they're not FDA regulated, so they are come in different doses. And so when you try to study them, you don't really have a standard product. And so some of them may work, and then the next time around they don't work because they're not a standardized product. Um, so that's one of the problems. And there's a lot of claims made about them, about them being safer. Well. If you don't have any data, you can always say something safer. And I can tell you that the day after WHI came out, our fax machine was just spinning with all of the other companies saying, try my drug because it's safer than Premarin. It's like, well, we never compared your drug against Premarin. You have no evidence that it's safer. But that was really the way the marketing works is let's, OK, that's dangerous. Let's go to something else. But it's like, well, we didn't even study that. At least Premarin we've studied very thoroughly and for a long time. So we've been following these women for a long time and looking at these effects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.